Welcome to the Ultra Tap pedal tutorial. My name is Joe Kotze with Eventide. In this video, we're going to explore the knobs and buttons on the front panel and listen to how the parameters relate to each other. As an effect, Ultra Tap evolved from the world's first programmable modular effects processor, the Eventide SP2016. In its time, it offered the widest variety of delay and reverb effects and introduced algorithms like Dual Digiplex, which had two separate delays, each with two taps, and Multi-Tap Delay, which introduced delays with up to 25 taps in stereo and 50 taps in mono. But now we could impart creative tap spacing and shape the volume envelope of a very large multi-tap pattern all in one effect. Years later, with the release of the iconic H3000 Ultra Harmonizer, we saw an actual algorithm called UltraTap. It featured 12 delay taps with full control over individual panning, levels, and delay times. It even included a diffuser to generate dense gated reverb effects. Eventually, UltraTap would be developed into versions featuring 24 and 36 delay lines. Now, the UltraTap pedal is capable of wielding up to 64 taps, allowing artists to achieve a wide gamut of sounds from traditional delays to special effect multi-tap patterns to unique reverbs and everything in between. We can create wacky comb filtering or rhythmic delays and also huge pad-like swells. In fact, UltraTap blurs a line between multi-tap delay and reverb with new advanced features like Slurm, which allow us to smear taps together and add modulation. Onboard tremolo, auto swelling and gating allow us to tone shape the taps. With controls like spread and taper, the pedal will make our tap patterns behave unlike anything we've ever heard before. Though the effect breaks the boundaries of what you think a multi-tap delay should do, the design simplifies its capabilities across six knobs, each with two levels of control. On the front panel, we have immediate access to the primary controls in black. Mix, taps, length, feedback, spread, and taper. To access the secondary controls shown in blue, press the page button. The lit LED indicates the knobs now control tone, slurm, pre-delay, chop, any one of speed, rise and release, and output level. To return to the primary set of controls, press the page button once again. For the majority of this demo, I'll be connecting my guitars to UltraTap in mono, but outputting from the pedal in stereo. Though all of the controls work the same way in a mono rig, when connected in stereo, UltraTap's delay lines alternate their panning automatically, so I recommend following along on a stereo device to hear the effect's full character. With this in mind, let's take a guided tour of each parameter. The mix knob controls the balance between dry and wet signal. Usually we expect the midpoint of any mix knob to give us an even split. The most important thing to understand about this parameter is that the balance curve is curated to give us a wider sweep of the dry signal. This means the true 50-50 dry-wet split happens about two-thirds of the way up. This is beneficial for really busy settings. One of my favorite presets that shows what UltraTap can do is called Batman, which you can find on the list of factory presets on the Eventide Device Manager or access via MIDI. This is what the pedal sounds like dry. With the knob a third of the way up. With the knob at the midpoint. Even at the midpoint, what we assume to be the even split, we can still sense the dry signal prominently over the effect. At the true even split point, it sounds more like it becomes part of the effect. The 
Let's try it. Fully wet. Let's try it with some overdrive at the split point. The main takeaway is, the dry signal remains strong through the majority of the knob range, past the actual midpoint. Around two-thirds of the way up, we can sense the even split. UltraTap has an extremely wide sonic palette, and if we're playing through a very busy preset, this tapering allows us to get a better feel for our dry signal. The taps knob is very straightforward. Use it to set the number of taps after the dry signal. Using preset 2 called Stutter as an example, we have the knob set for two taps. This means we'll hear the dry signal and two taps afterwards. If we set the knob to four taps, then we'll hear five copies, the dry plus four taps. Of course, if we set the mix knob fully wet, then we'll only hear the number of taps that we've designated with the taps knob. For example, I'm going to set the knob to 8 and take the mix knob fully wet. As a result, we'll hear 8 taps. If I add some dry signal back in, then we hear 9 copies of the signal, the dry plus 8 taps. Notice how in stereo, each subsequent tap gets panned in the opposite direction. I'll go back down to four taps to hear this more clearly. The dry signal remains in the middle as each tap gets auto pan for the duration of the number of taps that you've designated. The only time taps do not get panned is when the knob is set to one. The lonely tap gets panned in the center along with the dry signal. Of course, if you use ultra tap in mono, every tap gets panned in the center. So let's take it to four taps to hear this in mono. Let's try eight taps. Now let's play the same thing in stereo again. Connected in stereo, the movement we perceive from the auto panning adds to the width of the effect, and it's especially fun when we're creating rhythmic delays, reverb sounds, or making use of the slurm control, which we'll talk about later. It's important to note that the taps knob is laid out in such a way to make it easy to access lower number of taps with greater precision. In general, lower values on taps lends itself to multi-tap delays that have discernible patterns, like I've been playing all along. Higher tap values allow us to get into reverb territory. We'll learn how to perfect those types of sounds throughout this tutorial, but the behavior of the taps start to change once we experiment with the length knob. To demonstrate what the length knob does, I'll start with the knob in the middle at the half note position. As we turn the taps knob, we can hear the number of taps increase as expected. Notice how they tap faster and faster. This is because the taps are bound by the length of time specified by the length knob. Put another way, length is the total amount of time over which the taps are spaced. Taps, in essence, divides the length. Within a specified amount of time, you'll get X amount of taps. If we add more length, the amount of taps remains the same, but now the taps are spread within a longer time frame. So I'll go from eight taps spread across a half note length, to 
to eight taps spread across a whole note length. Once we set our length, the more taps we add, the less space there is between taps. On the pedal we have two modes, preset select mode and tap mode. By holding down the right foot switch for two seconds, we can switch between them. We know we're in tap mode when the LED button is lit or blinking. A solid LED indicates the pedal's tap mode is set to time, while a blinking LED indicates it's in tempo mode. We can switch between them simply by pressing the LED button. The tap spacing within a length we set is determined by these two modes, time or tempo. From factory, ultra tap functions in tempo mode, so the note value icons spread along the length knob are quantized to the BPM of the pedal. We can access dotted versions in between each note icon. In tempo mode, increasing the number of taps within a specified length will quantize those taps to musical subdivisions, and this capability renders some novel results. For example, if we set length to a whole note and taps to one, we'll hear the dry signal followed by a single tap on the downbeat of the next measure. Taps to two and it subdivides a whole note into two half notes. Taps to three and it creates three taps quantized to a half note triplet. Taps to four, and we get four quarter notes. And so on. The maximum amount of time over which the taps can be spaced is nine seconds in tempo mode. Be aware that it is possible to have the length clipped at nine seconds if the BPM is low enough and the length is high enough. On the other hand, time mode allows us to sweep the length knob from zero to 4,000 milliseconds. Using this mode, we can achieve non-musical unquantized spacing between taps, strictly mathematical, so to speak. This also renders a very different result than forcing the repeats to musical subdivisions. And at higher taps knob settings, time mode is especially useful to create reverbs that sound more natural. For example, I'll set taps high and play it in tempo mode. Now I'll do the same thing, but playing it in time mode. For a reverb-like setting, time mode works really well. In this mode, the front panel icons no longer correlate to note value, so I recommend making adjustments by ear. In tempo mode, it's important to note that the last tap in the sequence always lands on the downbeat of the note value. For example, if we set taps to eight, the feel of the pattern is written musically like eight eighth notes, but because the sequence doesn't start until we play the dry signal, it pushes the notes over by one subdivision. So if we're performing to the beat, the last tap sounds off as we're playing right on the downbeat. If your aim is to have the pattern end before the downbeat of the next measure, just set taps to one less tap, put the pedal in time mode, and turn length in milliseconds to adjust the timing of the spacing according to the note value that you want.
Now the last tap will end right on the subdivision before the measure ends, rather than right on the downbeat. The relationship between the taps and length knobs is the most important one on this pedal. Their interaction provides us with the basis for interesting multi-tap outcomes. For example, to achieve tremolo picking effects, we want to keep the taps distinguishable by using a low tap count, but within a short time frame. So I'll start off with taps to eight, and I'll set length to a quarter note. Now it's best to use tempo mode for this so that the taps will be musically spaced according to the tempo. To achieve rhythmic delays, I recommend reducing the number of taps even more and increasing the length. So I'll set taps to three and I'll set the length to a dotted half. Something as simple as adding one more tap can change the texture completely. Even setting the length to a half note will also change the pattern to something new. As we just heard, adjusting the length gives us a different result than adjusting the number of taps. The pedal takes care of the math and adjusts the taps within the new length. As we play in time, we can hear how ultra tap can get us interesting in between rhythmic divisions. This is for me the real magic of the pedal. We start adding taps to create a foundation of sound on which to layer our performance in all sorts of crazy ways. Finally, we can achieve reverb-like tones if we take the taps beyond 16 taps. You can think of changing the length as changing the reverb's decay, right? The more taps we add, the more dense the reverb sounds. Now listen to what happens when we shift from tempo mode to time mode. We can hear how the reverb gets smoother. A lower number of taps can make it sound choppy. However, too many taps within a length and we can get artifacts. So by set length to there, we can get kind of gated reverb effects. However, if the length is too short, then we can get artifacts. If the length is too long, even setting taps to 64 won't render a realistic sounding reverb. For me, the optimal length is around there. But there are many tools we can use to shape the reverb. In fact, UltraTap has at least six or seven tools, which I'll list clearly for you later. We've only just begun to scratch the surface of what this pedal can do. But the important lesson here is that this method of using taps to divide up the length 
is what allows us to explore novel sounds and uncover experimental textures. Between both tap modes, time and tempo, there's a world of difference in feel, and the results play differently with the features we'll be talking about next. Up to this point, we've experienced a constant spacing between delay taps. We've learned to change their behavior using either tempo mode for more musical quantized repeats or time mode for finer control in milliseconds. UltraTap has a unique parameter called spread that allows us to influence the rhythmic spacing of the taps that is different from simply using either of the two tap modes. The effect is most obvious with a higher number of taps and longer lengths. This is what it sounds like in the middle. As we start to turn counterclockwise from center, more negative values will group taps towards the beginning for a slowing down feeling. Put another way, turning to the left is going to push the taps together, closer to the beginning of the tap pattern. At the center, there is no effect on the delay, meaning the taps are spaced according to the standard length, taps, and tap mode settings. As we turn the knob clockwise from center, more positive values will group taps towards the end for a speeding up delay pattern. Values between zero and halfway have linearly increasing or decreasing tap spacing, and values halfway to maxed out have exponentially increasing or decreasing tap spacing. This just means that going beyond halfway through the range on either side will create a more drastic bunching up of taps through the end of the range. For me, the sweet spot sits in the first half of the range on each side. Keep in mind that the tap mode also has an influence over the way the spread controls the spacing, where tempo mode will quantize it and time mode will rely on the milliseconds you designate. So here's that, that theme again in tempo mode. I'll switch over to time mode. Back to tempo mode. I tend to favor tempo mode a little bit more because I get the feeling that sometimes it adds an extra tap or two, depending on the quantization or the subdivisions I've set. Another tool in UltraTap's delay shaping arsenal is the taper knob, which changes the volume envelope of the taps. More simply, we can make the tap sequence fade in or fade out. I'll start out with preset two and set it to 16 taps and set my length to a whole note. Setting the taper knob to the zero point in the middle means we'll have equal volume across all the taps in the sequence. 
As we turn taper to the right, it creates a fade down along the length of the entire sequence. Farther away from center will make the fade more drastic. With a lower number of taps, we have to go deeper into the range to get a similar result. At high enough tap settings, long lengths, and with the use of this taper control, we can simulate the way traditional delays echo out. Of course, the special thing about UltraTap is that we can make the taps behave in an unorthodox way by creating a sequence that fades up instead. As you go left with the taper knob, it increasingly imposes a fade up over the taps. Using larger tap counts, it sounds like inverse reverb. It also works better with shorter lengths. As I've said before, for reverb type sounds, changing the tap mode to time tends to sound a little bit smoother, right? Settings in the first half of the range tend to make the inverse effect sound more connected to the sound, so... Just like the spread control, this knob works in such a way that values between zero and halfway on both sides have linearly increasing or decreasing tap gains, and values between halfway and maxed out have exponentially increasing or decreasing tap gains. More simply, beyond the midpoint on each side of the range, the fade up and fade down effect will be more drastic the deeper you go into the range. One of my favorite settings is using the taper knob set to the fade up range and taking the taps knob to 7. I use time mode to get a feel for a full bar of 8th note taps, including the dry signal. Let's try that with some micro pitch delay. In a more traditional delay, we set our delay time and add feedback to create repeating echoes. UltraTap works the same way, except we're repeating an entire multi-tap pattern. Whatever result you get after setting your taps, length, spread, and taper, the feedback control will simply echo that pattern. Under the hood, it's simply a single tap at length value delay that is fed back through the entire multi-tap machine. The result of this architecture is that any of the tap machine controls will still affect all the echoes in the feedback loop. Notice if I play a pattern with a lot of feedback, 
and then manipulate the spread and taper controls, we'll hear them also be adjusted in the echoes. All TAPS machine adjustments are live, even in the feedback loop. Of course, if you wanted to keep things really simple and make UltraTAP respond like a traditional delay, you can set TAPS to 1, set your note value delay, and turn up the feedback. But we'd be missing out on all the pan delays, the multi-tap mathematics, and all the other processes that make UltraTAP interesting. Plus, with traditional delays, we can't always control exactly where the taps are going to stop. UltraTap not only allows us to do that, but we learned earlier that at higher tap values and longer lengths, UltraTap can sound like a delay with feedback if we use the taper control. In this pedal format, UltraTap now features this feedback parameter we can apply to the entire pattern to keep the trails going. In fact, turned all the way up, it sets the pattern in an infinite loop we can layer upon. When I'm feeling experimental, I like to start out with the feedback set to infinite. Then with my tone knob turned all the way down for effect, I'll lay down a background. Once I've got it looping, I'll bypass the pedal to play over that loop. The feedback will hold my loop in place because the pedal's bypass mode is set to DSP plus effects, allowing the delay to continue while bypassed. <laughs> Up until now, we've learned the basics of the front panel primary controls and listened to the behavior of the taps within a predetermined length, added a custom swing to the tap spacing with the spread knob, and even adjusted the volume envelope of the tap pattern using the taper control. To round it off, we learned how we can further repeat the entire multi-tap pattern using feedback. All of these tools make up what is described in the pedal's quick reference guide as the taps machine. But there are many other sound shaping tools found on the secondary parameters page that can greatly influence our tone. I'll address them in the order they affect the signal chain. Let's begin by pressing the page button to access the pre-delay, which adjusts the amount of time before the tap start. How pre-delay works is dependent on the pedal's tap mode. When set to tempo mode, ultra tap's default state, the pre-delay can be set according to one-fourth the note values of the icons on the front panel. So 16th notes become 64th notes, 8th notes become 32nd notes, whole notes become quarter notes, and so forth. We can access dotted versions in between. Please note, there is no value between 0 and 1 64th. If tap mode is set to time mode, the knob range goes from 0 to 1000 milliseconds, or 1 second. Be aware that the tapering is set so that shorter times are easily accessible in the first part of the range. Where in the first half of the range we go from 0 to 225 milliseconds, and in the second half we go from 226 milliseconds to 1000 milliseconds. We can use pre-delay to create some space for ourselves between the dry signal and the effects. I'll demonstrate this using a preset called Hala Notes which we can find on the Eventide device manager. It's set to time mode and it starts out with about 100 milliseconds of pre-delay. Let's take that to about 300 milliseconds.
If I take away the pre-delay, it's a different feel and a more immediate response from the wet effects. Pre-delay can be used as a tool to carve out a space for our dry tone and change the response of the multi-tap pattern. Next in the signal chain is the tone control, which affects the sound before it goes to the taps machine. We can use it to roll off the low end or filter the mids and top end completely. It won't affect the signal coming out of the taps machine or signal already in the feedback path. At the midpoint, there is no effect on the sound as it remains unfiltered. Turning to the left, will make darker sounding taps as it moves a high cut filter from 20 kHz at the midpoint to 200 Hz at fully counterclockwise. From the midpoint to full clockwise, there is a low shell filter at 4000 Hz. It goes from flat at the midpoint to minus 12 dB all the way down. Let's listen to how applying the tone filter affects the signal going into the taps machine. Using a preset called Bouncing Ball, Pay attention to the character of the taps as I move the knob left or right. As you can see there, the tone control does not affect the signal in the feedback path. It only affects the signal going into the taps machine. At the center, there's no effect on the signal. All the way to the left, and we filter out everything but the lows. And towards the right, we cut the low end and some of the mids. Chop's main function is to add texture to the signal before it hits the taps machine. The chop control is divided into three ranges. Tremolo, Swell, and Trigger. Depending on the option we choose, the knob labeled Speed Rise and Release will control the speed of the tremolo, the rise time of the swell, or the gate release time of the trigger function. It is possible to use UltraTap strictly as a tremolo, but we can also turn it into a chop machine. To demonstrate this feature, we can set the pedal to preset number 5, where mix is all the way up. There. In the first half of the knob, we find the 5 LFO wave shapes for the tremolo. When CHOP is pointing to any one of these LFO shapes, the speed rise and release knob will be controlling the speed of the tremolo. The pedal's tap mode also plays a role in affecting how the tremolo speed behaves. If UltraTap is set to tempo mode, the LFO rate is quantized according to the common note values shown here. If UltraTap is set to time mode, the speed knob can be adjusted from 1 to 20 Hz. With this preset, we're working within time mode. Press the page button to make sure we're controlling the proper parameters. Let's try this on a triangle wave. And now a saw wave. This is what the ramp sounds like. Let's try this on the square wave. And finally we have random sample and hold. I'll change over to tempo mode so we can hear the difference in response of the speed knob. In tempo mode we can hear each discrete subdivision as we pass over it. If I switch over to time mode, we notice we achieve faster rates and change values more smoothly. 
To reiterate, the tremolo aspect of the chop parameter can be used to add texture to the sound going into the taps machine. For example, on my MIDI controller, I've assigned three onboard ultratap presets. The first one is called zipper verb, and we can hear a saw wave adding an interesting effect. Or on the preset named Clockworks, we can hear a ramp LFO soften up the onset of a large number of taps spread across a long length. This is without the chop. And if we add the ramp LFO back in, It also adds a cool warble to a sustained note. And on the other preset called Mosquito, Chop is set to a square wave. If I take away the Chop, we can hear the original multi-tap pattern. Add Chop back in. Adding the LFOs from the chop function can be very transformative. The next tone shaping tool along the chop knob is the swell range, which we can use as a way to soften the transient of the signal going into the taps machine. Think of swell as an auto volume fade in processor for the attack of the signal. Some people's first inclination when they read the word swell is to assume that it's a feature to control the input or output volume of the entire signal. Let me state it clearly. This is not a general auto volume control for the input or output of the pedal. This is a tone shaping tool meant to mold the attack of the signal before it hits the taps machine. As we sweep the chop knob in the swell range, we adjust the input sensitivity of the auto volume processor. Higher values will make it harder to trigger the fade in. When the chop knob is in the swell range, the speed rise and release knob controls the rise time of the swell. After the input signal rises above the sensitivity we've chosen, we can make the volume swell from 0.1 seconds to 1 second. To demonstrate this, I've set up the pedal so it's just dry signal and a few taps. No other parameters on the pedal are affecting the signal. I'll start with chop in the off position. If I put the chop knob in the middle of the swell range and set rise to its lowest setting, listen to how the attack of the taps are controlled. I'll go back and forth between off and the swell range. If I add more rise time, we can hear the swell have a greater effect on the signal. Higher rise settings work better when the instrument is sustained longer because there's more of the signal to fade up, but it also gives the perception of lower volume compared to lower rise settings. I'll put the mix fully wet so you can hear this distinction. In the lower sensitivity portion of the swell range, we perceivably get more sustained signal in the delay, but it's also dependent on the rise time as well. At higher sensitivity settings, the fade in of the signal doesn't happen until the signal goes above a certain threshold. So there's a sensation that less of the signal is getting faded in. 
if we give the sensitivity time to reset by putting space in between the notes that we play, we can soften the transient of the delay taps. sensitivity settings of this kind, it's dependent on the output of your instrument and the dynamics of your performance. To show how effective swell can be in context, let's use the third preset called Ultra Swell. Going back to what I was saying earlier, the sensation we get of an input swell is not generated by the swell range of the chop knob. In fact, I can set the swell to off and will still perceive that auto volume effect. It's actually the result of having 64 taps crammed into a two bar length, having the mix knob set at 100% and being under the effect of the taper knob. In this case, swell, as it pertains to the preset, is used for subtle sweetening. Since we remove the swell function by setting chop to off, we can hear how the reverb-like multi-tap pattern sounds shrill. Add swell back in, and it smooths out the sound nicely. It's subtle, but spread across the transients of 64 taps, and it works to make the sound wonderful. Lastly, don't confuse swell with the negative range of the taper parameter, as swell processes the input of the taps machine, where taper is auto volume processing on the output of the tap pattern itself. The trigger range on the chop knob gives us access to a gating effect that chops off the end of sounds headed into the taps machine. Preset number four called Glitch Trigger is a great example of how to use the chops trigger range. Notice how once I pass the threshold, the gate stops affecting the signal. Similar to the swell knob, if we give the signal enough time to go below the threshold, the chopping gate will affect the signal again. When the chop knob is in the trigger range, the speed rise and release knob controls the release time of the gate. This sets the amount of time after triggering before the gate kicks in and chokes off the sound going into the taps machine. It ranges from five thousandths of a second to one second of release time. Basically, higher values will allow more of our signal to go to the pattern generator. Lower values will let less of the input signal go to the pattern generator. As we sweep through the trigger range, we increase the input sensitivity of the gate. In any part of the trigger range, as soon as the input signal goes below the threshold, it resets the chopping gate. That being said, lower sensitivity will allow quieter signals to be affected by the gate. Higher values won't allow quieter signals to be affected by the gate. To give you a clearer picture of how it works, it's most evident when we're playing with dynamics. So in the lower part of the range, you'll hear the gating affect more of the signal.
Listen to how the gate kicks in if we hold a chord and its level goes below the threshold. If I take trigger all the way up, we raise the sensitivity, meaning less of the signal is affected by the chopping gate. As with any device that has an input sensitivity control, many things play a role in making your adjustments. Playing dynamics, your instrument type, even the types of pickups that are on your guitar. Nonetheless, with the tremolo, swell, and trigger ranges, we can add interesting textures to the signal before it goes to the taps machine. One of the most interesting parameters on UltraTap is slurm. It's a made-up word that is short for slurring, smearing, and modulation. Slurm. We're aware it's the name of a fictional soft drink in a cartoon series, but it's a very real control on UltraTap. It takes the taps, smears them together, and adds modulation. As a starting point, I'll begin with preset number two. Higher slurm settings make the taps sound more diffuse. The higher we go, the taps become increasingly smeared, lose their attacks and definition, and become more chorused. With a lower number of taps, turning slurm all the way down sounds more like a regular delay. But if you raise slurm, particularly past 50%, it reduces the attack of the delay. As one of our effects artists likes to say, it takes the delay taps and ghostifies them. With mix set above 50%, taking taps above four, very short lengths, and setting chops, setting chop to off, you can take slurm above 50% for a type of chorus sound. Putting the pedal in time mode serves to smooth that out a little bit. Without slurm. With slurm. If you're familiar with Eventide's micro pitch delay, you'll recognize the sound of that modulation. Combine that with some reverb like diffusion, and Slurm does some beautiful things to the multi tap pattern. <laughs> Lastly, the pedal features an output control, which is a secondary parameter of the taper knob. It ranges from minus 18 dB to plus 9 dB. Output is at unity gain when the knob is in the center. I recommend using it to optimize the balance between the bypassed volume and the result of your process signal when activated. So now that we've covered all the knobs, I'll combine that knowledge to create a preset. My favorite use of Slurm is to make a higher number of taps sound more reverb-like. In fact, I saved Slurm for last because it really is UltraTap's secret weapon when it comes to these types of sounds. So using preset two as a starting off point once again, I'll add a high number of taps. Right off the bat, we can tell that the sheer number of taps in a short length is causing a lot of noise. So I'll increase the length to give the taps some space to breathe. 
and reduce the output level just a little bit. And now I'll take the slurm control and max it out so we can smear the taps and add some modulation. I'll also change the pedal's tap mode to time to make the taps a little bit smoother. I'll use the filter to take out some of the low end and back off on the mix knob just a tad there. Now I'll add some feedback to elongate that tail a little bit. And I'll use the negative range of the taper knob to give the reverb tail like an auto swell. And finally, I'll use some pre-delay to put some space in between my dry signal and the tail. UltraTap features two foot switches, each with a corresponding LED button. The active foot switch serves to engage or bypass the effect. When activated, the corresponding LED will light up. Typically, when an active foot switch is pressed, it latches or remains in a given state until it's pressed again. A cool feature of UltraTap is the ability to change the active foot switch from latching to momentary functionality by pressing the LED above it. When set to momentary, the effect is activated as long as the foot switch is pressed and automatically bypasses when released. The tap foot switch has two modes, preset select mode and tap mode. If the LED button above the foot switch is off, we're in preset select mode. Consecutive presses will allow us to serve presets incrementally. Searching past the fifth preset goes back to one. When we land on a preset, the LED on the ladder will blink for 5 seconds. Within that time, press the active foot switch to recall. Upon activating, the LED will turn solid. Otherwise, the preset search will time out and remain on the current settings. Though the pedal can only access 5 presets, it can keep up to 127 in its memory. By connecting the pedal via USB to a computer, you can use the Eventide Device Manager application to view, edit, and select presets from a list. Move them into or out of your top 5 slots so that later you can access them on the pedal. EDM also allows you to create and restore backups of your entire list and to import and export individual presets to your computer. Please note that if you choose a preset on EDM that is outside of the top 5, the last two LEDs on the pedal's preset ladder will be lit. It's also important to note that anytime you make an adjustment on the front panel after a preset has been loaded, the preset ladder will blink once, indicating the preset has been modified. At this point, you should save your changes or risk losing them when you move to another preset. By holding down the right foot switch for two seconds, we enter tap mode, and the LED button will either be solid or blinking. If it's solid, we're in time mode, and tapping the foot switch will register a tempo in milliseconds. 
As discussed earlier, parameters like length and pre-delay will be adjusted in milliseconds, while the speed of the LFOs on the chop knob will be controlled from 1 to 20 Hz. If we press the tap LED button again, the blinking LED indicates we have entered tempo mode. If we tap the foot switch, we can register a tempo in beats per minute and the LED will flash to the beat. If we turn the length, pre-delay, and speed knobs, we can access common subdivisions along their length. The note values associated with the multi-tap pattern are preserved as the BPM changes. In general, time mode allows us to dial in more precise delay values, while tempo mode allows us to access discrete subdivisions for the multi-tap pattern, and preserves those subdivisions as the BPM changes. Apart from showing which mode you're in, the tap LED button also serves to save presets. To save your current settings, press and hold the tap LED button. The latter, active button, and tap button LEDs will blink. Press and release the tap LED button to select a location for your preset from 1 to 5. Press and release the active button to save the preset. The LEDs will stop blinking. The current preset LED will stay lit. Please note, save mode times out after a few seconds. Pressing either foot switch also exits save mode. One last note on foot switches and buttons. The pedal will remember the last state of the LED buttons when the pedal is turned off. So it will remember if the active button was in latching or momentary mode, whether the tap foot switch was in preset search mode or tap mode, whether the tap LED button was in tempo or time mode, and whether or not the page button was engaged. So always pay attention to whether or not it's lit to determine which parameters the knobs are controlling. My name is Joe Kotze with Eventide. Thank you so much for joining me on this ultra tap journey. I hope you had a great time. Take care.